It's Greg Grunberg, the great, big, beautiful actor from Star Wars, Star Trek, and geeking out on AMC. Oh, co-author of Dream Jumper. I think I plugged everything. But you are listening to the great, big, beautiful podcast. that I find the most compelling when I'm when I'm learning about science are the people that intersect the science with history because then you make it more real and you ground it in truth you ground it from you know at first we didn't know these things and this is how we ultimately came to believe in them or to be persuaded by the evidence of them because of these people and because of this history here are your hosts Jamie Green and Justin Connors So it might it may surprise you to learn this, Jamie, but I'm not exactly the most science-minded person. What? <laughs> I know that surprise. You're probably like, <gasps> but wait, 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 wait. ready? <gasps> <gasps> no. <laughs> Sorry. But it was, it's funny though, because growing up, when I was a kid, I loved like archaeology and dinosaurs and things like that, and I love space. I mean, what? what kid doesn't but I, I really liked it like I was the weird kid who looked at space books all the time and I don't know where along the way I kind of just backed off from it but it, it's, it was interesting to me when she was talking about you know adults can still learn and not and not feel like they can't do because at some point I decided I don't like science or not that I don't like it. I'm not good at it so I'm not doing yeah. it it was like I yeah. just decided <laughs> it's I mean I my day job is not scientifically related either. You know, I'm I'm an editor. I work in right. publishing. I, I work with words. Um, but, you know, like you, growing up, I was also really fascinated by science. My, my dad is a scientist and he's a Ph.D. in anatomy. He, you know, he wow. taught at university. He did research. Um, and I was I was really good at math. Like mm -hmm. I remember taking calculus and not just suffering through calculus, but right. being very good at it. Yeah. Um, and when I went to college, it was sort of like, okay, now that the world is open up to me, it's not mm -hmm. just whatever, like the same five classes in high school I have to take. So yeah. what is it that I really want to take? And I remember I took an anthropology class and just fell in love. Right. And it sort of combined my love of um, history and, you know, the idea of digging for dinosaurs, even if I wasn't digging for dinosaurs, archaeology right. was still digging for history. Yeah. Um, and it, it combined a lot of the things that I left together. And that's what I pursued. So I pursued a science, but it wasn't, quote unquote, a hard science. Mm -hmm. And I remember, though, in college, having a lot of friends who were in the engineering program and they were just suffering day after day. Yep. They were always in class. They were always <laughs> studying. They were always in labs. They were always doing group work. And I remember in college thinking, whew, good thing I didn't choose engineering because, <laughs> man, that would suck. You know? And it was, it was, it was like kind of eye opening to me at the time that, like, I had considered that. Like, right. well, maybe that's something, you know, like, you know, we talk about with Emily today in the show. Like, that's, they're well-paying jobs. There's mm -hmm. a lot of demand for this kind of thing. It's only going to get bigger, you know, the demand. And I just remember thinking, man, I'm, did I make the right choice? <laughs> well, that's even in, in my wife, Sarah. Well, I don't have to say my wife to you. You know who she is. But to the people listening, my wife, Sarah, is a nurse. And when she went through nursing school, before she did that, you never think of nursing as something very science-based. But it was incredible what she went through in nursing school and the things that she had to learn. And, you know, it was very much more than just, you know, taking care of people and, you know, making I mean, sure they have their pillow fluffed. And you know what I mean? It yeah. is seriously science based. And I and I thought that, too. Like, she'd come home, like, so stressed out. And I was like, man, there's no way I could not do no. classes like that. <laughs> and, you know, they always say, you know, nurses are in high demand, too. Like, right. So if you're looking to change careers or, you yeah. know, you could move into nursing or something. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not you. That, that makes it sounds so easy like oh i'm yeah, gonna change no, career i'm a nurse yeah. becoming a nurse in terms of like the 
preparation wise, it's mm-hmm. almost as intense as becoming a doctor. Yeah, it, it is. It, re- it was really incredible. And, and before I experienced her going through it, I would have never thought. Yeah. I never would have imagined. But after seeing what she went through for four years, it, it was really tough. Like, I mean, even getting into the program, you had to have yeah. almost a 4.0 in, in high school to even get into it or be considered here anyway. It was a big competition. And yeah. it's, it's just incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, doctors have to go through that multi year residency, yes, which I don't think nurses yeah. have to do. No. But up until that point, it's mm-hmm. basically they're on parallel tracks. Well, and they, they could, like, if she wanted to, she could go and get her master's and then become, you know, PhD or whatever you want to do. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, we're t- we're talking so- the science today. I know it's a little off track. We're talking but science. We're talking science, baby. <laughs> and, yeah. So, and funny so, enough, I was a big Bill Nye fan, and our well, guest today. So okay, what were you gonna say? You go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say who wasn't really. Yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, who, I mean, find me somebody who's not a big Bill Nye fan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And I, I was telling Jamie before we started, people, my science teacher. Sometimes it was like a. Friday afternoon, we would get Bill Nye. That would be our teacher for the day, and I loved, I loved it. You know, you hear that, and I, and this, I, I forget. I don't know if it was Jamie that you said this, but people nowadays, our kids, I feel bad for them because they don't know the joy of hearing the TV roll down the hallway. You get like the, oh, the yeah. TV in class. Like, <laughs> yeah, everybody would in. silently be going, "Yes, yeah, yeah, Bill Nye day." day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but our guest today is doing something with the new Bill Nye show, and that's incredible. And she hosts her own show, and she's highly educated. Why don't you tell us about her a little bit? Yeah, so today we're talking to Emily Calandrelli, who, like you said, she is going to be a, she's one of the science correspondents for the new Bill Nye Saves the World show, which is coming to Netflix in April. Um, But she's also been the host three seasons now of Exploration Outer Space, which is on Fox. Um, It's it just, if you've never watched the show, I, I think it's on Hulu. So if you have a Hulu subscription, you can watch all three seasons of it. Um, it's, but it's one of those shows. It's like, um, and this sounds like I'm selling it short, but it's, it's like Cosmos light. You know, if you've watched Cosmos, um, you know, either the original Carl Sagan version or the remake that they did with Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, you know, they go super in depth with science, with space and space exploration and astronomy. Um, exploration outer space doesn't focus on one specific topic each episode is sort of dedicated to its own thing but they're all revolving around outer space but it presents topics in a way that you know non-scientifically educated people can understand um and it's a you know she travels all around so she she takes the cameras into places that we might not normally see so she goes to nasa training grounds she was on the vomit comet you know that does the whole parabolic flight so you simulate weightlessness um and it's just it's a really fascinating show it's great for all ages uh, so kids who are interested in space can definitely um sit down and just you know binge them if you've got hulu um, but she's, so those are two things that she's been involved in. Those are probably the two biggest, um, reasons you may know of her. Uh, but she's also, she's done a couple Ted talks. She's done a Google, t- uh, talk. Um, she is all over the internet. She writes for TechCrunch. Um, she's very active online and she's just, she's just brilliant. And she's a, she's a fantastic spokesperson for science and space exploration. I can't wait to get into this. We had such a fun interview, so we're going to go play that for you right now. Hope you enjoy. So I wanted to start by asking, your academic background is in engineering, aeronautics, and astronautics, which is intimidating for me just to say. Um, But I wonder (laughs) if you remember what first set you on that path. Was science always something that fascinated you when you were a kid? Uh, you know, not really. Um, I wasn't one of those kids that grew up thinking that I wanted to become an astronaut, you know, ever since I was five years old or anything like that. But I was always fascinated with space. I was kind of an anxious kid growing up. Um, I'm still sometimes an anxious adult. <laughs> and I grew up in West Virginia where uh, the night sky was always, there was always really good conditions for looking up and stargazing and and looking up at the night sky. So I remember having this kind of calming effect as a child, Mm -hmm. looking up at the night sky and looking at the stars. And it always fascinated me how big the universe was. So I think that was always in the back of my mind. And then when I 
grow up, I found that I was really excited about math. I really loved math in high school and in college, and I think that just sort of manifested itself into, I like math. Uh, engineering sounds like a good, solid career. Um, and then I just happened to go into aerospace engineering because I, I really like space. Yeah. It was funny. I, I was watching an interview with you, and you said that at one, at one point you just sat down and you kind of did a search for what, what could I do with math that it also will make a lot of money. Yeah, I was a very practical child. <laughs> I definitely, I looked up, you know, like what careers made the most money, and across the board, it was consistently those STEM careers. And engineering sounded like it had a lot of math, and I was like, I think I can do that. Yeah. So, at, at what point did you realize, though, that you know, academics and content aside, that you really had a gift for for communication and being able to explain what might be complex scientific concepts in a way that, you know, lay people, quote unquote, would be able to understand. Yeah. So I think in college and uh, in like any extracurriculars, there's always, you always have group projects, right? And then with many group projects, you have to assign one person to be the spokesperson or one person to present. And just Consistently, I found that I was always the person that either volunteered or was dominated <laughs> to be the spokesperson of the group, uh, <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. To, to other people, that was intimidating or that was scary or it wasn't fun. And for me, I I loved making PowerPoints about <laughs> science, and I loved <laughs> talking about science in front of the class. And so I think, you know, I didn't realize that that could ultimately become my career. Yeah. <laughs> and when that <laughs> happened, it was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of different avenues you could have used to talk about science and space. Is What's the most compelling thing of, uh, about the format you've pursued, norm notably television? What's special about it? Yeah, well, for, for TV, I mean, you're right. There, there's so many different ways that someone can become a science communicator. And one right. of the most common ways that I see is with YouTube. Um, there's a pretty low barrier to entry in creating a YouTube channel. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that do that. And then the really, really talented ones grow an enormous following. And that's one of my favorite platforms that I see. For me, TV is unique because you are welcomed into people's uh, homes. Uh, we are in my TV show, Exploration Outer Space, um, which is on Fox. It's in 100 million homes in the U.S. And wow. so just having that access to people um, is, is unique and really incredible. They can be watching SpongeBob one moment and <laughs> Exploration Outer Space the next. And I think that's a, a unique avenue to reach people. And I like TV because I like to not just write about science. I think there's something special about seeing someone uh, mm -hmm. visually representing science. Um, for me, I'm a visual learner. And so I think with TV or with any type of media where you're watching the science happen, that's one of the most effective ways to communicate uh, different scientific complex topics. Um, so before I get to that, so you, you mentioned Exploration Outer Space. Is there going to be a fourth season? Yes, actually. We just got news a few weeks ago that there's going to be a fourth, fifth, and sixth season what? of Exploration wow. Outer Space. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it seems that the people who are watching SpongeBob wow. also like watching space <laughs> TV shows. That, oh, that's going to be... That's going to be a great feeling to go into doing your fourth season and know you have two more on top of that. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's uh, no better gift than job security. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, though, you got you, there's got to be part of you inside that's kind of freaking out and going, oh, my God, now we need to come up with enough content, enough things to talk about for that many seasons. <laughs> You know, I thought that after the first season, because in the first season, we covered, like, the major space topics, like going to the moon, okay, going to Mars, yeah. or just going into suborbital space, and I thought that we had covered all the major topics, and when we got to season two, I, you know, reached out to my friends in the space community, and you find that there's just a wealth of projects 
always yeah. on the horizon in the space industry. And so each new each year brings new projects. So I'm actually I'm not concerned about it. It's actually really exciting because now that people know of the show, they feel comfortable reaching out and proposing projects that they think should be featured on the show. So uh, I have I kind of crowdsource yeah. the ideas from all my friends in the space community, which is really helpful. Yeah, that's got to be a great help. Um, okay, so I've asked this uh, to a few of the people we've had on the show, including Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, so it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, and it's it seems to be that recently, as a society we've been really pushing STEM disciplines. And there's a reason for that. And, you know, we've mm-hmm. especially been pushing it among young kids and, and young girls. And I obviously, I think, as many kids who want to pursue science, engineering, math, as a career should be encouraged to do so. But I also mm-hmm. feel like because of that emphasis, we're, we're sort of falling behind on, on pushing the humanities to kids. Um, obviously those careers don't pay as well and they don't, they're not as flashy, but I I can't stop thinking about how frightening the world might be if nobody studied history and, or English, (laughs) you know, or just basic grammar. And I, I worry that this election that we all just (laughs) suffered through is, is evidence of what that world might look like. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. And my, outlook on this is I would always encourage people to be sort of a, uh, uh, the Renaissance man, you mm-hmm. know, the colloquial Renaissance man where you try to, uh, learn all different types of things. But for me, science isn't as exciting without all the other stuff, without history, without policy, without being able to write well. I mean, it's hard for me to communicate science without knowing grammar, right. <laughs> without knowing, uh, uh, just the the how to properly storytell things like that so intersecting all of those different types of subjects um makes it, it lifts science up i think and so when i think about you know the neil degrasse tysons of the world the bill nyes of the world i would like to imagine kind of like a super league of heroes that we have the neil degrasse tyson of space and science but we also have somebody like that for history or for art, yeah. and we need these these storytellers in all different types of field be, fields because they are incredibly important, and we just need to make them accessible to little kids. For science, uh, I think we we love the Bill Nye's and the Neil deGrasse Tyson's of the world because science, more so I would think than any of the other disciplines, seems incredibly complex and mm-hmm. sometimes too complex to even comprehend and so it, it's especially magical when you have somebody like that that can that can make it understandable and interesting um, and so yeah I would love to see more people like that for uh, for other fields and I think we're getting there with platforms like YouTube and there are some really good storytellers online that are uh, storytelling with many, many different types of, of subjects and fields. So I do think we'll ultimately get there, but yeah, I, I agree. All yeah. of those things are very important. Yeah. It, it, it's amazing to me. I mean, when you think about science and you think about many of the reasons that Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye have become so famous is because science seems to be that it, it it's, I use science generally, but like it's also very visual. So even though it can be complex, it can be shown in a way that's a little bit surprising or, or memorable, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and that's a little bit harder to do with something like history. But, you know, th- th- that being said, you've got someone like Lin-Manuel Miranda who took Hamilton and suddenly, mm-hmm. you know, pulled him out of the cobwebs and the shadows and made him this huge towering figure that now every, like, my kids are fascinated by the American Revolution because of that musical. And I think that yeah. you're right. There are these other people out there. It's just a little bit harder to make history as exciting as something like, you know, you know, astronauts and going to Mars. You know, the, the, the wow factor might not be there. But the stories are there. And it's just finding the right storyteller to tell those stories. Um, I just exactly. worry that we're not pushing our kids in those directions enough. That's my only concern. Yeah, yeah, I, I can totally see that. But the... the the stories that I find the most compelling when I'm when I'm learning about science are the people that intersect 
the science with history, yeah. like the series Cosmos, for example. Sure. I mean, they did a really good job of bringing in the the history and the people that made the science possible. Because then you make it more real and you ground it in truth. You ground it from, you know, at first we didn't know these things and this is how we ultimately came to believe in them or to be persuaded by the evidence of them because of these people and because of this history. Yeah. So why is it then in 2016 we are still debating some of the most basic and fundamental aspects of science? Like why are there still so many people who refuse to accept this overwhelming amount of evidence for whatever it might be? I mean, obviously the biggest issue is climate change that people are just refusing to believe that that's a thing. But it's it's not just climate change, you know, it's it's the safety of vaccines. It's it's um you know, uh digging, you know, uh oil pipelines and oil spills and you know there's every day there's a new issue and it just seems people are so happy to just turn a blind eye and say that's not real that's not actually a thing yeah that this is a really good question and and it's one that a lot of people are trying to trying to figure out because it doesn't have as much to do with logic and reason as one would like yeah it, it to have uh, it to deal with because for climate change, um, for example, I think a lot of it has to do with what the group that you identify yourself with believes. For example, usually political groups, conservative versus liberal. And it's harder for people to go against the ideals and beliefs of their group, even when logic and reason are telling them to do so. Mm-hmm. So for somebody who identifies as very conservative, traditionally a very conservative audience would either not care about climate change or not believe in climate change and it's hard very hard for any individual who really identifies as part of that group to cast themselves out as an outsider um and to you know stand up for this cause that they think you know actually i do believe that climate change is happening so it, even that you know even if logic and reason are telling them to do that so i think it has more to do with with that it it it's a problem that climate change has been cast in the light that makes it a political topic Mm -hmm. um that just sort of happened i think because big oil companies have a uh have a big incentive for people to not believe that climate change is happening um so it, it has more to do with the political group that you um identify with and i think once we can really approach the topic in a way that makes it less political that can be the key to um to at least addressing a problem and identifying that there is a problem yeah so do you think that group identity that inability to break away from groupthink and what everybody else that you believe on other you know you might agree on other topics you know so you feel forced to agree with them on every topic is that group identity the greatest barrier um, to scientific literacy among the general public, or do you think that it's something else? Well, I think that for those of us that have convinced um, or, or do believe in things like climate change, for those of us that have been persuaded by the evidence, when we're trying to convince others to be more scientifically literate, we have to approach the conversation differently. Nobody is going to be uh, going to want to listen to you if you start out by calling them stupid. <laughs> and so I think for those of us who are trying to create a more scientifically literate society, we have to be more compassionate about why people believe in what they believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and coming to the conversation with that understanding and trying to find some common ground as to you know, find things that you both care about and then going from there and not starting the conversation off with, I can't believe you don't believe in this. You're such an idiot. Um, then we can, we can make some progress, but I think it's all too easy to start off a conversation with that because it's kind of fun to be like, Oh, you don't believe in climate change. That's really stupid. Or you think vaccines are dangerous. You're a terrible parent for not giving your kids vaccinations. Yeah. Like we need to get to the root of the problem and understand why people believe things that they believe and be compassionate in that. Um, Cause it's, it's more than just science. There's, there's so many different uh, aspects to this problem and what convinces people to believe what they believe in. Yeah. 
So kindness is what you're saying. Kindness will go a long way in, t- in empathy <laughs> and when, you, yeah, when you're trying empathy, to... Yeah, empathy, 100%. When, when you're trying to get somebody to, to listen, kindness and empathy will go a long way, but that's not going to open up a mind that's already closed. And that's that's a little bit trickier to thing to do is to get somebody to listen. I mean, you could you could be as as rational as logical as as kind <laughs> and as empathetic as you, as possibly it, it could it could be possible to be um but like you were saying if somebody is is already set in their ways and they say well my people think this way and that's why i think this way it's it's not going to really change much unfortunately yeah but you can play on that dynamic too because people also identify with groups of their friends, with groups of their family. And if you are related to somebody who doesn't uh, believe in certain science topics or doesn't like to think logically, I hate saying believe in science topics, yeah. but <laughs> doesn't, isn't persuaded by evidence on various science topics, um, then they also identify as your aunt or uncle yeah. or friend. Mm-hmm. And so you can be the most influential person in that, in that person's life. So I like to encourage people to reach out to people that they love about these topics because a lot of times if you're having a Twitter battle with a stranger, that's <laughs> not going to go anywhere. <laughs> people aren't going to be persuaded. It never does. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm curious what the response was to your space exploration is the worst TEDx speech. How many people just totally missed the sarcasm and real point of the talk? <laughs> There is a number of them. I would not <laughs> read the YouTube comments on that one. Um, but you know, I, it was it was a very unique style of communicating that I tried out there. Um, I was when I was writing that talk, I was debating whether or not I should just write a straightforward. These are the reasons why space exploration is worth money, you know, uh, versus doing a very different style of talk where I was very sarcastic and I played devil's advocate basically throughout the entire speech. Um, And I did it in that way because I wanted it to get more views. Um, If I just said, these are the reasons why space exploration is worth it, Mm -hmm. then it probably, I would have been preaching to the choir and it would have gotten maybe like 600 views (laughs) on (laughs) YouTube. Um, But by using a different style, um, I got a lot of uh, YouTube haters, but I also got something like 50,000 people to watch it. Um, so it, it was effective in reaching mm-hmm. out to a lot of people. I, I like to go by the, um, the mantra, you know, you don't, you don't usually fail by, or you, you fail by shooting too low and hitting, not by shooting too high and missing. Right. I, there's, I'm saying that wrong, but there's no, something, yeah. <laughs> there's something it. there that's like, that if you don't push yourself to do something unique or different, that's how you fail. Um, and so that's what I was trying to do with that speech. I was trying to do something a little mm-hmm. bit creative, and it was effective in some ways because it reached a it reached a decent <laughs> sized audience. Yeah, it could it could have been titled "Space Exploration Is the Worst You'll Never Believe." Number three. <laughs> <laughs> oh exactly <laughs> now. It, it, it was hilarious just scrolling down I, I am one of those people I'm in the camp of never read the comments but it was oh, yeah. I, I scrolled down and it was just like you know, like, no this speech is the worst and it was like clearly like <laughs> yeah, this person yeah. didn't watch more than the first two minutes or something you know but like and it wasn't the only oh, comment yeah. it's just it's so disheartening <laughs> yeah yeah um I know you are also involved with uh, the new show, Bill Nye Saves the World, which is coming to Netflix. Um, I'm just curious how that came about and uh, how you got on the show. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I knew the show was happening um, about a year ago, and I interviewed for one of the positions. I interviewed to be a correspondent with Bill Nye. Um, and, you know, I met with Bill Nye, and we just talked for about an hour and it was it was basically an interview about various science topics that mm-hmm. i was passionate about and i had never been so nervous for anything <laughs> in my entire life <laughs> i like bed read all of his uh all of his books before i got there just in case he was going to quiz me on <laughs> different things in his books and did you he know, i we talked 
Uh, no. He okay. Didn't. It was actually <laughs> a really wonderful conversation because Bill Nye is just a wonderful person, and he's naturally excited about all things science. And we ended up talking a lot about, I'm from West Virginia, and coal mining is a big thing in West Virginia. Therefore, a lot of people don't like to believe in climate change mm-hmm. because it is not in their best interest to think that climate change is happening because it hurts the coal industry. Um, and so I was talking to him about that dynamic um, and how it's, it's so disheartening to come from a place that is against a lot of the things that that you like to talk about and learn about. And he had actually just finished a speaking engagement in West Virginia. So we had a lot to talk about there. Um, and that, anyways, that was an hour-long conversation that was one of the best moments of my life. <laughs> and came home and waited a few months and finally got the call that I had been selected as one of the wow. correspondents. Wow. And so now we've we've wrapped season one. It premieres um, April 21st on Netflix. All of the episodes will come out at once. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be awesome. It's the same weekend as Earth Day and the Science March and all that. Oh, that's fantastic! Wow. So, I mean, all I've seen of it so far has been uh, I think a couple of different promotional videos that have come out. So, I mean, what's the format like of the show, and how does it compare to the original Bill Nye the Science Guy show? Yeah, so it's definitely meant for families and for maybe an older audience rather than just kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're talking about stuff that you, you, you've heard of that you're familiar with, but you may not really uh, completely understand. So, of course, things like climate change. You can't have a Bill Nye <laughs> show without climate change. Um, but also things like gene editing, CRISPR technology, and space exploration, and genetically modified foods. And all, I mean, there's just a full spectrum of things that we talk about. And they're all very fascinating but what makes him even more interesting is that he brings in all of these guest stars and he'll do experiments with them or he'll do different uh different interactions with him to demonstrate uh, with them to demonstrate uh the different various scientific topics that we're covering nice. um and then the correspondence kind of like field correspondence on the daily show mm-hmm. we went all around the world to cover various stories for him so we each did about three or four stories for um, for Bill and I, for, so I'll be in three episodes and then the other correspondents will usually be in three or four episodes. And so, you know, I went to the other side of the world to cover three different topics. Uh, and then we went back into the studio and chatted about those topics with Bill and I. Nice. Are, are you able to say what those topics are and where you went? Or is that like all hush hush still? I am not just yet. <laughs> no, okay. I don't think so. I, yeah. But know that we were in different countries and we i i mean i think it's pretty obvious i covered the space story um and some other ones so yeah you'll have to check it out on netflix (laughs) can't wait can't wait um a few weeks ago my daughter came home from school and she had a handout for a a new girl stem program put on by the university they're going to come to the school and they do it at lunch hours and my daughter is mostly involved in art stuff right now, dance, music, that type of thing. And she was so excited about it. But then she started telling me the boys in the class were putting it down and making mm-hmm. fun of it because the girl they couldn't do it. Only the girls could do it. And so that, that kind of floored me because I didn't realize, you know, they're only nine years old. And this is still something that she's, you know, she's experiencing this type of uh, backlash from boys at this young of an age. So I'm curious what you think. How important are programs like this for girls only coming to a, like a university coming and putting this on? Yeah. Oh, that's such a funny, uh, funny result from something like that. And I, yeah. I can understand why I guess boys would react like that because right. you know it's it it feels like you're being excluded from a mm-hmm. really cool group. Um, and for that age, they probably don't know yet that STEM is a male-dominated field right. because they're all taking science class and they have probably an equal number of girls and boys in their science class. Um, I didn't actually know until I got to college that engineering and science were male-dominated mm-hmm. fields because in my high school, we had a ton of girls that were really great at science and math. 
And right. then I got to college and I looked around and I'm like, why am I the only girl here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, how did that happen? Um, so I think it's incredibly important to do those all girl right. programs when they're younger. Um, it's important to make it normal that girls mm-hmm. like science and math and technology. And, you know, it. I can see why it's uncomfortable for the little boys in the class, but that's just, you know, as they grow older, it will become more apparent why those programs are so essential. And mm-hmm. one of the, the best outcomes of that, I think, is meeting the other girls that you share that common interest with. Yeah. Because as you get older, it's harder to make those those female friends that also like science and engineering and technology. And so now one of, one of the best strategies that I tell uh, younger girls, younger female students in engineering, is to make a solid group of female friends and stick together because you're going to want to <laughs> build, uh, lift each other up and complain about certain things that happen to only you from mm-hmm. the other guys in the classroom or whatever it is. Um, but having those female friendships is, is crucial to making sure that you can keep doing what you love to do. So I, I wonder, you may have just answered this then, I mean, what advice do you give to kids um, who are interested in science, but they, they either think that it's either, quote unquote, oh, it's too hard, or, or it's not cool, it's not mm-hmm. something It's not something that I, I really am going to get excited about? Yeah, I mean, I, so usually um, the, the way that I get around that question is I show all of the amazing things that I was able to do for free mm-hmm. because I was in science and engineering. Um, things like flying on the vomit comet, for example, mm-hmm. that plane that is used to train astronauts to learn how to, to cope with microgravity, to cope with floating in space. Um, and then not just that, but being able to travel for free to have paid internships. There is so much money in science and engineering for students who want to pursue those majors um, because they're they're valuable to the economy, they're valuable to companies, and people will pay you to do science and engineering all around the country and all around the world. And so I've been able to have so many incredible opportunities to see the world and to do fun things for free or even get paid for it, which is very rare for other majors. Um, It's hard to find good paying internships as a student um, in other majors. So that's the angle I usually go with. I mean, I think it's it's, it's also just, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, money speaks pretty loudly. (laughs) At least it did to me when I was, (laughs) when I was younger. Um, But yeah, I I just, I think talking about those opportunities and talking about how it, it can be fun. And then Getting over the the difficulty angle, knowing that you can make yourself smarter is really empowering Hmm. because your brain is just like any muscle in your body where you can train it to be better. And, you know, I wasn't considered one of the smart kids when I was in high school. There were definitely a group of smart kids who, you know, had tutors for their SATs. They got into all the best undergrads, and I was not one of those kids. Hmm. But I spent a lot of time studying in engineering and undergrad. I spent probably twice the amount of time studying than my most of my other classmates, and I made myself smarter. And I made myself, uh, I made it easier to learn things more quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think telling other kids that you can do that too is exciting and empowering and that there's no topic too complex for you to ultimately learn. It may just take you a little bit more time than some other kids, but you can, you can learn all the same things eventually. Yeah. That is empowering. I mean, even as an adult, it's, it's, it's still, mm-hmm. cause you don't often hear that. Nobody tells you that you can be smarter. You know, it's either like once you, well, <laughs> once you grow up and you're yeah. an adult and you have a, you know, career yeah. or whatever, it's sort of like, well, I'm stuck. This is what I am now. This is how I'm defined. And it's 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 so rare to have somebody tell you that, like, no, you still can do almost anything. Like, it's it's going to take mm-hmm. you longer as an adult than yeah. it would as a kid, clearly. But you can still make yourself smarter. <laughs> yeah, I think it's exciting. It, there's still a lot of exploration and development to do throughout all the stages of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so- 
Go ahead, Jen. So I, I read when we were when we were doing some research, I came across an article that I think you might have wrote it, but I'm not sure. But it was in it. It mentioned that you wanted to be a Disney Imagineer, and, and we were, <laughs> yeah. we're we're big Disney fans here. So I had to ask about it. Um, so you actually went and worked in the college program at Disney. What happened there? How like what? Where did you work yeah. in the program? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I my family's obsessed with Disney. We mm-hmm. went to Disney a lot growing up um and i wanted to combine my passion for math and for disney and so that naturally led to me being like "Ooh, i should become an imagineer <laughs> yeah and i could design the rides at disney and, and, and it still sounds like that would be a really fun thing to right? do doesn't it, uh, so it <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like maybe the perfect job but when I, I got to college i did the college program at disney um to shadow um, some Disney Imagineers. And wow. I mean, basically I was, you know, 18 years old. So I was working in, in the parks, but then one day a week or two days a week, we had a class about Imagineering where we learned about all the strategies that Disney uses and the Imagineers would come into the classroom and, and tell us about it. Um, and then we got some tours of, of the rides and stuff like that. So it was a really cool experience. And at that point in my life, that was like, that was it. I was going to become a Disney Imagineer. <laughs> um, but then I, I think along the way, after I grew up a little bit, um, for me, I, I found things that I was even more passionate about, something mm-hmm. that I felt had, uh, at least personally to me, more meaning. Uh, so I dropped that, that dream along the way. But yeah, when I was younger, that was the goal. It, it's it's interesting because Disney, you know, in in a large part of what they do through the Imagineering, it's I mean it's it's all about show and it's all about immersing you in whatever world or idea that they want you to be immersed in. Um, I wonder if you took even if it was subconsciously you took any of those skills and ideas of the show and presenting presenting something so the audience feels totally absorbed by it and and whether you've used any of those same skills in the projects that you do now which is to some extent very similar you know you're you're talking about a scientific topic but you're still pre- presenting it as part of a show and is presenting it as this 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 world that's going to suck you in and engage you and 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 put in this is all that matters at this moment yeah, I've actually never thought about that, but <laughs> I'm sure that there are, there are um, certain aspects of it. I mean, one of the things that Disney is best at is storytelling, yeah. and knowing how to tell a good story is key to public speaking. It's key to being a producer for a TV show, to writing TV shows. It's key to being a good science communicator, um, because you have to get people engaged in what you're talking about. And, yeah, I mean, if Disney has taught me anything, it's it taught me how effective storytelling can yeah. be. So yeah. hopefully I, I infuse that a little bit into my job today. <laughs> um, you mentioned the science marches. Are you going to be taking part in any of them? Or in one of them, I should say? I hope to. Yeah, the, the one in San Francisco, I'm planning on uh, at least speaking in it if I'm here. There's, it's, I have... Um, a possibility that I might be out of the country mm. during that time. So hopefully if I'm here, I will be participating in the San Francisco one. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I live just outside of D.C., so I'm going to be taking my kids down to the big one in D.C. Hopefully it'll be good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be great. I hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> at the same time, you know, as excited as we get about the the marches, it is kind of frustrating that we need to have them you know, at all. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it's you know, we talked a bit about this earlier, but it's frustrating to see that there's so much skepticism and denial of science, um, not only just among the general public, um, but also increasingly among lawmakers and in the current administration. It's re- really showing its ugly head. Um, mm-hmm. As somebody who has devoted her life to science and scientific pursuits and knowledge and, and learning and, 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 you know, becoming more intelligent, like we were saying, what gives you the strength to carry on in the face of such frustration sometimes? Yeah. So I would say the silver lining to the 
Trump era, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what else to call this, um, is that I think before this, I didn't, I had this feeling that people didn't care about science. I was always fighting, you know, an upcurrent battle, an uphill battle to get people to be excited about science. But now that all of this is happening, so many people have come out of the woodwork fighting for the pursuit of scientific knowledge and for the, the, you know, the ability to be persuaded by scientific evidence. And I am so, I think, enlightened that there were that many people that cared that much about science. And it's really inspiring and it's uplifting and it feels really great to have a science march. Yeah. I mean, who knew that that many people cared so much about um, about reason and scientific knowledge? And, and so for me, that feels empowering and that feels really exciting to have so many people fighting back. Um, and I don't know that we would have had that without this Trump era of ignoring science. Um, <laughs> So for me, that's it's empower. It's exciting for me to continue to do my job because I feel like I have so many people behind me, so many people that are excited about learning and who are fighting for, uh, for the ability to be um, persuaded by scientific evidence. Yeah. And it's bad that our lawmakers are not <laughs> part of that, or at least most of them. Um, but I think because the people are, eventually that will change. I hope so. It's a good silver lining, though. It's a good way to keep things in perspective. I hadn't really thought about it like that. Yeah. Um, shifting gears to a you know a fun a f- more fun type question. Um, <laughs> when you think about science fiction and the technology that exists in you know in film and books, um, in your opinion, what piece of sci-fi tech that we don't have today would fundamentally change humanity for the better? Like, what what do we need to invent? in order to save humanity, I guess. Yeah, I've thought about that question. And for me, traveling has been one of the most uh, transformative things that I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I think traveling and living in other cultures makes it easy to have empathy, makes it easy to understand people's point of view that is different than your own. And so I think that developing a mode of travel that is very, very cheap um, would be life-changing. You know, I've lived in China before. I, I lived in China for about three months. Where did you um, live? In a pretty rural part, Xi'an, or Xi'an, uh, depending on how you yeah. pronounce it. I, I know. Well, I, I lived in <laughs> and, China for three years, and my wife, that's where my wife is from. So. Oh. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, <laughs> so if you've ever been to Xi'an, that is a very it's it's a definitely a city but it's one of the more rural cities yeah and i met so many people there that had not only not left china but they couldn't even afford to travel to other parts of china they couldn't afford a train ticket to go anywhere else and so the only life they knew was that one city and that was the only thing that they would know from when they were born to when they would die Mm -hmm. and it was hard to you, to relate to that, you know, because I've, I've traveled to a number of countries and I've, I've learned how different people live, different walks of life. And I think that's helped me understand um, different people's cultures. I think it's helped me to become empathetic. I think it's helped me to become independent. Um, and I think making that easier, lowering that barrier for most of humanity would be groundbreaking. Allowing other people to see that, see different parts of the world not only would help us learn more about each other and each other's cultures, but it would help us appreciate this planet that we live on um, and appreciate it for the beauty that it it has naturally and wanting to maintain that beauty for a long period of time. So for me, I think that something like that could be amazing. Yeah. You're in good company because I I think, unless I'm misremembering Justin and correct me, but we asked the same question to Neil deGrasse Tyson and I believe he said, he said the same thing. He said, he, uh, he said a transporter. And he didn't even hesitate. It was transporter. Ah, so, yeah. yeah. You're, it's you're transporter. In... Okay. Yeah, well, that's one step, that's one step beyond, yeah. <laughs> Being able to transport everywhere would make people very, very happy. Yeah. 
that that's amazing though that you where you were for three months is what you know i know that city very well i've been there many times so that's fantastic yeah oh that's fun (laughs) um what keeps you up at night oh i mean other than the current political climate i don't think (laughs) that's that's keeping everybody up at night yeah that's just like a a constant stream of anxiety I've, I've had this <laughs> like latent anxiety since the election. Yep. Um, so knowing that that many people uh, could vote for somebody like Trump uh, has made me has just completely unsettled my view of the country that I live in. Yeah. Um, so that and then I think besides that, something that I think about a lot um, is mental health. And I don't think that it has the amount of attention that it should have in this country because we don't we don't fund it properly we don't give people the proper access to mental health that they should get um it's very expensive to uh be able to receive you know mental health counseling when i was at mit that is a very intense place where people can often find themselves in very dark places throughout their MIT career. And so MIT does this wonderful thing where they focus very, very heavily on all of the students' mental health and provide them with free counseling throughout their time there. Um, And I think that we should be doing that for everyone in the country um, because having a happier society will lead to so many other benefits. Um, And, you know, I think we all know somebody who struggles with depression or anxiety or you yourself are suffering from it from time to time. And it can lead to very dangerous outcomes. And I don't think it's something that uh, our country is focusing on today. So, you know, something that's not really related to space or technology, but I think that it it impacts all fields. So that's kind of something that I think about. So the flip side of that coin is what has you most excited for the future? Yeah, I think for me, in my own little niche, the thing that I'm really excited about is what's happening in the rocket industry right now uh, with with Blue Origin and SpaceX perfecting rocket reusability. Yeah. I think we're at an inflection point for space travel because right now what we do, rockets are the only means of travel where we throw away the you know transport method right after one flight. And if we did that with any other industry, with trains, with cars, with planes, that industry would not be able to survive. It would be way too expensive to maintain or to commercialize or for any normal person to be able to afford a ticket Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, or a car at all. Um, And so with rocket reusability, I think that they're changing the game. They're making rockets more like commercial airliners. And it's going to make it easier for people to gain access to space and hopefully make it easier and cheaper for us to get to another world. Uh, so that's, that's the most exciting thing that I'm, I'm you know, anxiously waiting mm-hmm. to find out how that affects the space industry and space travel in general. Yeah. Um, Emily, thank you so much. I know we've run out of time with you, but thank you so much. This is just, it's been such a great conversation. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's great talking to you. Great talking thank to you. you. So I think I think you know you've arrived when you get to speak at a TED conference. <laughs> Is no, that, well, that be you awesome? know you've arrived when you're on this show. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that now she can put that in her media kit appeared on yes. the Great Big Beautiful podcast. That'll yeah. be front and center. Ted, TEDx. Google Talk, Bill Nye, Bill Nye. great big, big yes. podcast. First, for, above all of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, what a fun interview. And yeah, that was fun. I, I love talking to people that are vastly more intelligent than I am. <laughs> Isn't that everybody? Yeah. Oh! Oh! Every time I talk to Jamie. <laughs> no. No. No, no, but it's it's. I really love the depth and the variety of the guests that, that you find for this show, Jamie. It's pretty awesome <laughs> to, to go from I, I try, you know, to, try to, to spread us out well yeah but. i mean to go from an actor to someone who's actually you know worked for nasa and <laughs> you know what i mean and is a scientist it's just crazy it's awesome what a fun we try to be we try to be well-rounded on this show we try to be we try to be and hopefully you guys are liking it and if you are not subscribed and you want to be subscribed 
definitely go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and hit that subscribe button. That gets you a brand new episode every single week. And then you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at the GBB Podcast where we can talk about the show. Uh, let us know what you think about it. You can tell us that you didn't like it. You can tell us that we're stupid. <laughs> or tell us that you love us. Whatever you want to do. You know, I'm not, I'm not counting. Whatever you want to do. All right, guys, we will see you next week. I'm Justin at 140 Justin C. I'm Jamie at the Roarbots. And you've been listening to the Great Big Beautiful Podcast. See you, see you next time. <laughs> Take care. This podcast has been a production of the Geek Dad Podcast Network. If you've enjoyed this content, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash geekdad.